Hi everyone, welcome in. Just give a couple minutes so that everyone can get into the Zoom room. Okay, seeing some familiar faces, that's always fun. Maybe 30 more seconds and then we'll get started. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome in. My name is Maddie Cooper, and I'm the Associate Preventive Conservator at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCAHA. Some quick housekeeping before we get started. This room is set up as a Zoom webinar, so you don't have access to your camera or your microphone, but I encourage you to use the chat function and if you feel so inclined right now, go ahead and introduce yourself. I love seeing where everyone's coming from. There will also be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So you can drop those in the chat as well as they come up. And I'll try to get to everyone's question at the end. If you'd like to utilize the closed caption function, you should be able to enable it through the Zoom toolbar. And as always, feel free to reach out by email after the presentation or at any point in the future about the content included in this presentation or just any other preservation questions. And finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a short survey. It's really, really helpful for us at the center to receive feedback on the programs and topics that you would like to see in the future. So we'd really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to fill that out. A quick thank you to our funders who make these free webinars possible. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Humanities, the William Penn Foundation, and the Independence Foundation. And just a quick note about the organization that I work for. The Conservation Center is a regional conservation lab and preservation services facility. So we're based in Philadelphia, but we work with organizations and clients all across the country. Our conservators treat paper-based objects like books, photographs, documents, artwork on paper, and more, and our preservation services staff work in the field, providing educational programming and helping institutions plan for the future of their collections. And as a preventive conservator, I'm lucky to get to work with both the conservation department and the preservation services department. CCAHA also offers a wide range of digitization services, as well as fundraising assistance, housing and framing, and more. And you can learn more about us and what we do at our website, which is ccaha.org. Okay, let's get into it. So we're going to run through all of the sort of essential questions when it comes to defining salvage priorities. What are they? Why are they important? Who should be involved in the process of defining those priorities? And then how do we narrow down that list? And then what do we do with that list once we've come up with it in the first place? And just as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube channel probably next week. So don't take stress about um, taking notes or missing anything. And also I'm going to, at the end of this presentation, drop a PDF that has links to all the resources that I'll be talking about today. So um, know that that is coming as well. So if you're here, then you're probably familiar with the importance of emergency preparedness and response for cultural heritage organizations. Large scale disasters like hurricanes and fires can cause catastrophic damage to entire collections. And even smaller scale emergencies like leaks caused by plumbing issues can cause damage that is difficult and expensive or even impossible to reverse. And the best defense that we have against the consequences of emergencies is planning and preparedness. 
Um, and there are a ton of tools available for helping you plan for and respond to emergencies. You might recognize the logo for the new and improved D plan, which is um, an online tool that walks you through the development of an emergency plan. Um, this guide from the Getty is also great. And then my very personal favorite tool ever made, the Emergency Response and Salvage Wheel. Um, fun fact about the Salvage Wheel, it was first published by an organization called Heritage Preservation in 1997. And the idea from the format came from a household hazardous waste wheel that one of the staff members had on their refrigerator at home. And so that's where they got the idea of the format. And then they corralled like 30 conservators into condensing all of their salvage recommendations into these little pie pieces of the wheel, which I think is just to get conservators to consolidate their thoughts that much is an incredible feat. Um, and the wheel has been translated into 10 languages and distributed across more than 40 countries. But I digress, that's just my little plug for the emergency response and salvage wheel. Um, all of these resources recommend establishing salvage priorities as a key component of preparedness, but what exactly are salvage priorities and why should we care about them? That, those ideas are a little bit less explored in these tools, which is why um, I wanted to put together this webinar. So what are salvage priorities? Well, simply put, they're a list of collections that will be addressed in some way, either before or after an emergency situation. Establishing a list of salvage priorities pre-emergency event is critical to the emergency planning process. That list of collections can be used to mitigate risk to high value collections and even to secure collections before an emergency event if you have lead time. Post-emergency, that list of priorities can be adapted into a plan of action for emergency response and salvage operations. And if we expand on that thought a little further even, if you're dealing with an emergency that has some lead time, something like a wildfire or a hurricane, having predetermined salvage priorities can give you an opportunity to stabilize collections in place or even to move them to a safer area, either on or off site. I used to work at a house museum on the water that had us move priority collections away from windows and exterior walls and place them in drawers and cabinets before hurricane events. So that's an example of being able to use salvage priorities ahead of time. Or it can be as complex and huge as the British Museum evacuating collections, which they did in both World War I and World War II. Importantly, it also really helps create a clear order of operations for staff who need to get home and prepare for the coming event with their own families in their own homes. If you have salvage priorities, you're able to say, okay, our priority collections are in cabinets one through five. We'll prioritize prepping those cabinets and covering with them in plastic before folks can come go home for the day and make, and um, that kind of planning can make the difference between staff who feel supported and staff who feels angry and panicked when prepping for emergencies. Important to remember that the health and safety of staff always comes before the safety of the collection. And this kind of preparation work is a good way to ensure that that value is upheld. Post-emergency salvage priorities can obviously give a lot of direction to a response. They can also be a huge resource if you're unable to enter a building or an area until it's cleared by first responders. It isn't unusual for buildings that have been affected by disasters to be closed off for weeks or even months. And if that's the situation, then you may be able to hand off your list of salvage priorities and their locations to responders who would be able to get those collections evacuated before complications like mold or infestation get out of hand. That's obviously an extreme case, but it is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about salvage priorities. Another huge reason to determine salvage priorities is the way in which our cognitive function changes when we're responding to emergency situations. During emergencies, our heart rates elevate and hormones like epinephrine and cortisol flood our bloodstreams and affect the way that we think and act. And then when the imminent threat is over, serotonin and dopamine levels drop below the normal levels, which can impair our decision-making and cognitive function. And all that is to say, we aren't in the best position to be making decisions about the long-term preservation of the collection when we're responding to emergencies. Our brains aren't operating at 100%, they're in survival mode. 
I promise there's still a thousand decisions to make during the response, but establishing salvage priorities ahead of time brings that number down to like 990. And we're just being a little kinder to our future selves. I find that cultural heritage work is so often about balancing priorities across an organization. And there's so many different priorities. You know, curatorial priorities might differ from education and access priorities that differ from collections priorities. And even within collections work, you may be confronted with preservation priorities, salvage priorities, digitization priorities, and so on. And all these different categories can seem really overwhelming, but they can also be kind of helpful when it comes to defining priorities in a consistent and reproducible way. Some of you may be familiar with the process of developing preservation priorities, which is something that we do when we think about long-term preservation planning. That process might look like considering the significance of an object or collection, how it will be used in the organization, what the condition is, what it might need to be stabilized. Determining salvage priorities is very similar to determining preservation priorities. We're just including the factor of how vulnerable is this object to damage caused by an emergency. So we'll start off with some gimmies. At the top of your priorities should always be vital institutional information and then also loaned items depending on your loan agreement. Vital institutional information like inventories, catalogs, accounting information, it's all the data that you need to operate as an organization and that's always going to be a priority. Hopefully you keep digital records that you back up and store in the cloud and in another location. If that's the case, you don't need to worry so much about the server that's underwater. Um, but if not, you absolutely want that to be on the top of the list because it's vital for business continuity as well as any response and recovery. The second category to flag off the bat is objects on loan. It's not uncommon for salvage priority status to be stated in the loan agreement, so it's possible that you're obligated to address loaned items first. So I would recommend checking agreements and insurance coverage uh, for any mention of the handling of loaned collection objects in emergency situations. So we've got vital institutional information and loaned items on our list of salvage priorities. Next up, we want to add collections that are highly significant to the collection and highly vulnerable to damage caused by emergencies. These are the harder decisions to make. Remember that we're trying to make these decisions in kind of a consistent and repeatable way. So introducing a framework for evaluating significance and vulnerability can be really helpful here. Um, let's talk first about evaluating significance because that's something that's shared across determining a lot of different types of priorities. When we're talking about significance, we're talking about how much the object or collection in question contributes to the overall mission of the organization. So the first step is gathering all of your organization's core documents, things like the collections management policy, development policy, and strategic plan, the preservation plan. These can all be great references when you're making difficult decisions about prioritization. Key among those is the organizational mission statement. To make sure that you're really prioritizing collections that are significant to the collection, they should all align with the institutional mission. And you may find yourself in a situation where leadership feels that like a painting gifted by a wealthy donor has the most monetary value and should be a top salvage priority. But if it doesn't really align with the institutional mission and the collections development policy that you've laid out, then you can use that to argue for prioritizing objects that are maybe less monetarily but more institutionally valuable. Determining salvage priorities is not a one person job. It's definitely a collaborative process. When we're asking questions like, what is the object's significance to the collection? How is it used? How vulnerable is it to damage caused by an emergency? We probably wanna have a few folks at the table. It can be really helpful to have input from curatorial and education departments, as well as collections, facilities, and even first responders. Having a relationship with your local fire department is something that you may hear a lot when you're engaging in emergency preparedness and response. And there are a number of reasons for that, including pointing out priorities to first responders and allowing them to become comfortable with the layout and goals of your organization. For example, if you're working in a historic house 
and the structure of the building is integral to the mission of the organization, maybe you can have a conversation with your local fire department about um, making sure that they have a key to the historic house or access to a knockbox on the grounds so that responders can enter the building um, using a key and the door rather than breaking down walls, windows, and doors, if that's possible in the event of a fire. So we've gathered our tools and we've gathered our team and we're dedicated to do this assessment in a consistent, repeatable, and documented way. A framework for significance assessment can be really helpful with that. And the framework that I want to highlight here is from the Government of Wales, who created this really helpful and free download guide called Why Do We Have It? A Significance Process and Template. The guide was heavily influenced by another great publication that's called Significance 2.0, which was developed by the Collections Council of Australia. It's another great resource. And again, I'm gonna drop a PDF in the chat at the end of this webinar with links to all of these things. So um, don't worry about scribbling things down. This framework looks at the significance of an object as a consideration of value versus four comparative criteria, which are provenance, rarity or representativeness, condition or completeness, and interpretive capacity. You may be familiar with the key values of historic heritage, which are historic, artistic and aesthetic, scientific and technological, and social. I was introduced to this concept in graduate school using the example of clothes that Abraham Lincoln was wearing the night that he was assassinated, and that has always just so stuck with me, so I'm going to use it as an example here as well. The first value that we can talk about is historic. An object has historic value if it contributes to the understanding of the past. In the context of Lincoln's clothes, they certainly have a lot of historic value. They tell us about a particularly pivotal moment in US history, they're connected to a president, and so on and so forth. The next value we consider is artistic or aesthetic. While all of the values can be subjective, this one is probably the most so, but an object that has artistic or aesthetic value, if it's representative of beauty, craftsmanship, and artistic design movement, et cetera. If we're thinking about the Lincoln jacket, what you can't see in this image is that the coat was a custom made piece from Brooks Brothers, and the silk lining was hand embroidered with an eagle carrying a banner that reads one country, one destiny. This unique and skillful craftsmanship is an example of artistic or aesthetic value. If this coat was in a design museum, say, rather than a history museum, this artistic value may be put at the forefront rather than the historic story of the clothes themselves. Next is the scientific or research value. And this is based on the ability to use an object to perform some kind of analytical research. Natural history collections are a really good example of scientific and techn um, technological value. But there's something to be said about our example here as well. Perhaps Lincoln's coat has blood on it that could be tested and used to trace DNA, um, to do DNA analysis, trace genealogy, something like that. Finally, there's social value, which is an attachment to a community or a group of people. This can also take the form of spiritual significance, where the significance of an object includes its use in religious or ceremonial practice. It's a bit harder to find the social value in Lincoln's clothing, I will admit, but say there's a situation where the president wears the hat on President's Day every year during a speech. I don't know, I know it's not a great example, but you get the idea. Social value is tied to ceremony and use in a way that is unique to the other values that we're considering. Now that we've defined these values, let's think back to our friends in Wales. How are they suggesting that we practically do these significance assessments, thinking about these core values? They provide a form um, that can be adapted and used to determine significance for individual objects or small collections. This is an abbreviated version of that form, which you can see includes questions about the object's place in the collection, its provenance, et cetera. These are designed to get you thinking in the frame of mind and significance to collections. <laughs> Lincoln's jacket is owned by the Ford Theater, the mission of which is to explore the legacy of President Abraham Lincoln and celebrate the American experience through theater and education. 
And if we go through this exercise, we may find that the condition of the object is fair, that it's in the core collection of the organization, that the provenance is excellent. I looked into it and I thought this was interesting. Mary Todd Lincoln gave the jacket to President Lincoln's favorite doorman, Alphonse Don. The coat stayed in his family for over a century before it was donated to the theater in 1968. Um, and also fragments of the coat were removed as souvenirs by mourners and friends when the jacket was owned by the Don family, which is why um, one of the sleeves is completely detached from the rest of the jacket. It's one of a kind. It's representative of a historical event, person in time. This object has high historic value. Now this particular example may seem pretty obvious, but it's a good way to frame an approach to consistently defining the significance of collection objects. Determining significance is one half of the salvage priority question. The second half is determining the vulnerability of that object to damage caused by an emergency. The question of vulnerability is how we ensure that the collections that are most susceptible to damage are getting some love in the salvage priority department. The first thing to consider when determining vulnerability is deciding vulnerability to what? Are we talking a flood? Are we talking a fire, an earthquake? What are we talking about? Risk assessment is a process that can be really helpful here um, in helping you figure out hazards that your collection is most vulnerable to. I included on this slide a picture of the Guide to Risk Management for Cultural Heritage, which is my favorite resource for risk assessment. That's also a free download, also gonna be on that resources um, document that I send out. One thing that may make your life easier in this department though, is understanding that most emergencies turn into water emergencies, even if they don't start out that way. If you think about um, like a fire, extinguishing that fire requires a lot of water. If you have an event that takes out power, maybe now your HVAC system isn't working and the humidity creeps up, you're dealing with a moisture issue, frozen pipe, you're talking about a leak risk, it just somehow always becomes a water issue. And the Heritage Health Information Survey from 2014 kind of confirms this idea. 56% of the institutions that they surveyed reported suffering damage or loss caused by water damage, which was far higher than any of the other agents of deterioration. And it's for that reason that I usually suggest considering vulnerability of an object to water damage when it comes to coming up with salvage priorities. The major exception to this is uh, organizations that are located in wildfire prone areas. You know, there might be some cases where there's a small amount of lead time before a wildfire reaches an organization, and they may have an opportunity to evacuate some high priority collections. But in that case, you're not even really thinking about vulnerability. You're really just thinking about what is significant to the mission of the organization and what is accessible and can be removed quickly because wildfire damage is so destructive and complete that almost every type of object is very vulnerable. But with that in mind, let's consider the vulnerability of collections to damage caused by water. In general terms, the types of collections that are most vulnerable to catastrophic damage caused by water are start at the top with paper, books, and parchment, textiles, leather, ivory, and shell, iron, you're worried about corrosion risk, painted surfaces, photographs and film, plastics, and then down at the bottom of the list is glass and non-porous ceramics and non-ferrous metals. Condition is also a factor here, so when you're considering objects, those are, that are in poor condition are more vulnerable to damage just in general. And once we've established significance and vulnerability of an object, we can use um, a matrix to help us determine whether that object should be considered a high salvage priority. Those objects and collections with high significance and high vulnerability are high priorities. They're gonna end up up here in this top right corner of the matrix. And then everything else falls under that. If we consider another example from Ford Theater and go through this whole process together, um, we can kind of walk through an example. So the jacket that Lincoln wore on the night that he was assassinated is obviously a salvage priority for the collection. It's unique, textiles are highly vulnerable to damage caused by water incursion. And so let's consider that to be a 100 on the salvage priority scale. Lincoln's jacket is right up here in the top right corner of the salvage priority matrix. This can be helpful to have this kind of um, 
far to reach when we're making judgment calls about other parts of the collection. Say, however, though, that we are comparing these two small groups of objects that also belong to the theater. After an emergency, we can ask first responders to salvage the display containing Lincoln's clothing, and then also items from one other display. Should we choose the collections related to Dr. Mudd, the doctor and possible conspirator who treated John Wilkes Booth after the assassination? Or should we choose the collections related to George Azerod and Lewis Powell, who were Booth's co-conspirators and were meant to, but failed to, assassinate the vice president and secretary of state as part of a larger plot? Let's go through the process of determining significance and vulnerability, starting with the collection related to Dr. Mudd. If we fill out the significance form with information about this collection, we see that this group of objects includes evidence used in the trial of Dr. Mudd, a medical kit with mostly metal tools, the boot that Dr. Mudd cut off Booth's leg, which is made out of leather, shackles and handcuffs worn by Mudd when he was arrested, which are made out of iron. These objects are in good condition. They're in the core collection of the theater and they're not study collection objects. The provenance is very good. The collections are one of a kind. They are, you know, evidence that was used to convict Dr. Mudd, who was eventually executed. All in all, this collection has high historical significance, maybe a little bit less if we're comparing it to Abraham Lincoln's jacket. So if the jacket scores a 100 for significance, maybe this Mudd collection scores like an 85. Now, what's the vulnerability of the objects that we're looking at? Well, we've got some leather, iron, the medical kit is mostly metal tools. It looks like that tool wrap is maybe made out of leather. Um, so, you know, about moderate vulnerability when you average everything out. And if we plot the significance and vulnerability of the Dr. Mudd collection of evidence, it would look something like this. Now let's consider the other collection of evidence. When we're thinking about the collection of evidence against Powell and Azrod, we're taking about a we're talking about a book of maps, some weapons, a necktie, a saddle, a toothbrush, and a comb. They seem to be in fair condition, their core collection, good providence, their evidence that was used in the trial against these two co-conspirators. The collection is rare, um, and it's probably comparable to the collection related to Dr. Mudd. Maybe a little bit less, you know, Dr. Mudd, I feel like there's more public awareness about that name, but it's a decision that has to be made with the mission statement and collections policies for the Ford Theater in hand. So let's just say for this example that the significance of this collection is comparable to the collection related to Dr. Mudd. In terms of vulnerability, the paper and textiles are bringing up the vulnerability score a little bit. Um, you can also see that there's some, maybe some damage on this paper object, which might raise its vulnerability a little bit. So if we plot it and remember where our jacket and the mud collection were on the matrix. Now, if we consider the Powell and Azura collection, the material vulnerability puts it up a little bit higher into the red zone than the mud collection. We might then decide that the Powell Azura collection is going on the salvage priorities list. Of course, this isn't a perfect method of determining risk and making decisions, but it is a start. It's a process that is reproducible. It's a process that's documented. It shows our due diligence. Um, and I'm not even advocating, I guess, for this going through this entire written process for every object in the collection. That would be impossible. Most of us have um, a million jobs anyway. But um, I do think that it can be helpful to uh, have this matrix in mind when you're making decisions. It can be a helpful process when you're trying to make tough calls about what to prioritize. Because if we're running out of a flooding building, we can't save everything, unfortunately. So once you've come up with your list of salvage priorities, where should it live? Well, it should live in your emergency preparedness and response plan. And remember that part of the function of this list is to allow first responders who are not in your organization and who are not familiar with your collections to locate and secure objects. So you wanna make it as simple for them to understand as possible. Mark the location of salvage priorities on floor plan, include images of the collections in question and kind of put together like a one or two page document as if you had never been in your building or never seen those objects before. 
My third recommendation is to keep it brief. This is an emergency situation that we're talking about. There isn't a ton of time on either side of an emergency to deal with collections. And the number of objects or collections on your list of salvage priorities will depend on the size of your organization and the number of staff who are involved in preparedness and response. We talked about how we can use salvage priorities for emergency preparedness, and we also talked about how we can use them if we can't physically access the collections location. But now let's say that we can access the location, we have our list of priorities in hand, and we're starting the salvage process. Now what? Well, we start by assessing our existing salvage priorities. We follow the plan that we made. We check on the vital institutional information, the objects on loan, and that list of priority objects that have high significance and high vulnerability. Say they've either not been affected by the emergency or we've been able to stabilize them all and have some time, resources, and labor left over. What collections do you think about salvaging next? Um, well, all the things that are in our predetermined salvage priorities are captured in these first four points. Um, and all six of these points come from the emergency response and salvage wheel. At this point, you want to begin assessing items that are most prone to continued damage if they're untreated. Things that are in water, underwater, or even organic materials that are very vulnerable to mold, things like that. And then finally, you want to deal with items that are most likely to be successfully salvaged. So let's just return to the goals one more time and make sure we covered everything. What are salvage priorities? Well, they're a consolidated list of collections that you're going to focus on first when it comes to prepping for and responding to emergencies. Those are going to be key institutional records. They might be loaned collections, and they're gonna be collections that are high significance to your organization and high vulnerability to damage caused by um, a risk. Why are we making these decisions? Well, because it can be the difference between saving these vital collections and complete loss. And because we want to be kind to the versions of ourselves that are responding to an emergency situation. Who should be involved in determining salvage priorities? Well, you want to have folks who can speak to the different aspects of value and vulnerability that we're considering. It can also be really helpful to bring in first responders to get their perspectives. How are we making these tough decisions? Well, we're using a framework that's gonna help us make the process reproducible and consistent. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. And what's next? Well, we're putting our priorities in our emergency plans and revisiting them when we update those plans on a regular basis, ideally. So at this point, I do wanna open up the floor for a couple questions um, and just, to you know, see another image of the beautiful Ford Theater. After putting together this presentation, I definitely have to visit. I've never actually been, um, but I will pull up the chat now and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, let me also drop in the document that I promised, which has all of the resources that we talked about. I will go ahead and do that now. And hopefully you all can access it. Okay, I'll start at the top. Oh, I love seeing where everyone's from. Oregon, Texas. Nikki says it's hot in Texas. It's weirdly like 60 degrees in Philadelphia today. It feels sort of bizarre. Um, North Carolina, Portugal, wow. Okay, here's a question. How do you balance political stances and wants with what your salvage plan is? I feel like sometimes you can't disregard what they wish. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and you're totally right. Sometimes you can't disregard what they wish. And so if there are a couple of objects that the board or um, that the board want to prioritize or that are extremely politically relevant, um, I feel like they always end up ending up on your salvage priority list. Um, it's also an opportunity to say, though, you know, 
yes, okay, those objects can be a salvage priority, um, but because we have to prioritize them as well as other objects that are institutionally relevant, maybe I need more resources when it comes to emergency planning and response. So it could be an opportunity for um, kind of leveraging and asking for more support, but it is a difficult situation. I sometimes, um, when I teach salvage priorities with uh, in like a workshop context, I'll often use an example um, that I learned about also in grad school, which is Martha Diamond Smithsonite. And we look at um, the Hope Diamond in the American, uh, the National Museum of uh, Natural History. We look at three collection objects. We look at the Hope Diamond, we look at Martha, which is the last living passenger pigeon. Um, and then we look at Smithsonite, which is a, um, a mineral that was named for um, Smithsonian, the namesake. And we talk about which one of those items we would prioritize preserving. And it's a really um, interesting thought experiment because while Martha might speak more directly to the mission of the organization, the Hope Diamond is obviously um, a huge draw and is extremely monetarily valued. So it always leads to a really interesting discussion. Um, but anyway, I digress. Okay. Uh, any recommendations for how to encourage leaders to engage with and devote resources to disaster planning? Oh, that's such a good question. It's so hard. I feel like we talk about priorities. I mean, when we're working in cultural heritage organizations, prioritizing emergency preparedness and response is really hard to do until there's an emergency. Like when there's an emergency, that's when people are interested in putting resources and support into planning. Um, but I would just recommend uh, talking about how important it is. I mean, mitigation, and especially if you're talking in terms of risk um, and financial cost, putting support behind mitigation and planning is so much less expensive than a large scale salvage operation, especially when you're talking about water. I mean, dealing with a large scale mold event can be so incredibly time consuming and um, financially taxing. I think framing it as like, this could turn into a situation that we are not equipped to handle if we do not plan for it um, can be kind of helpful when you're trying to advocate for emergency planning. Wondering if you have any examples of how educators have weighed in to determine salvage priorities. Great question. Um, yeah, I mean, if your institution has a lot of educational programming and you have um, educators that are relying on certain collections or objects in your collection, that's definitely going to raise the significance of that collection. It's gonna you know, push that object into the higher significance category. So it can be really helpful to have educators involved in that process. And also just to think about what, when you're thinking about the core values of an object, um, it can also make a difference in how you're going to treat them. So for example, like maybe like a library and archive collection um, has high historical value. And that historical value is really informational. It's really like in the text um, that you're getting the value out of that collection. Maybe we're talking about institutional records or church records or whatever. Like the reason people need access to the collection isn't for aesthetic reasons, it's for information reasons. So in that case, you might prioritize um, preserving the informational aspect of those collections over the aesthetic aspect of those collections. So um, in a salvage situation, that might look like um, if, if you've got a collection of archival records that have been wet, definitely drying them out, um, but not necessarily prioritizing them when it comes to like aesthetic treatment. Um, Hopefully that makes sense, but I have another digression. But yeah, having educators involved, especially if educational programming is a big part of your institution can be um, really helpful. So some great questions here. How many items are you allowed to designate as your salvage priorities? Another good question. I, you know, I wish I could give you like an exact answer. Unfortunately, I'm gonna give you the conservator answer, which is always, it depends. 
But um, it depends on the size of your institution. It depends on uh, what kind of resources and support you have when you're doing emergency prep and emergency response. Um, I think, I don't know, depending on your institution, maybe five, 10 things. If it's larger, definitely, and you have more staff support, more, but it's really, unfortunately, um, just based on, on your organization and, and what you're able to do. I saw a presentation recently, and I, I'm so sorry that I can't remember the woman who was giving it, but she was speaking about a collection that she works with that was affected by the California wildfires several years ago. And um, one thing that I took away from her presentation, and again, I'm so sorry, I can't remember her name or the organization that she was working for, but one thing that really stuck with me was that she, looking back, really wished that she that they had had salvage priorities sort of defined and had those objects stored relatively close to one another so that when they did have a little bit of lead time before the wildfire affected their organization, they would have been able to go and evacuate some of those collections. Um, I'll just give it a couple, maybe more minutes to see any more questions flood in. Again, this is, you know, it's a complicated process. It's kind of a heady process. It's something that people don't really like to think about. It's not fun to think about like what you would grab if you're running out of a burning building, you know, um, but it is, it can make a huge difference. And um, having like a little bit of a framework behind it can be really helpful in giving yourself peace and also just um, in having a documented process that you can show folks that you did your due diligence when thinking about salvage priorities. Um, and as always, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to um, chat with you by Zoom or email if you are working on creating your salvage priorities and want some input or have any other questions. I'm going to drop my email in the chat here and um, feel free to reach out. And then if there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and let everyone go. I'll say have an amazing rest of your day, no matter what time it is where you are. Um, thanks so much for being here and look out for, um, you know, a summer of more content. We definitely have more programs coming up. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your day.